All right, today we're going to learn about natives in North America. We have three daily objectives. Number one, list some similarities among native peoples living in North America. Number two, explain how the environment influenced native survival strategies. And number three, explain how mercantilism works. So the natives in North America are much less advanced than their counterparts in Mexico. Um, they have some agriculture, uh, but and they do have permanent settlements, they do accumulate wealth, but it's not nearly as large of a scale as people in South America. And this is largely because there's just there's just way better soil in the Valley of Mexico than there is in much of North America, um, which is largely forested. So we do have development of social classes as a result of wealth. Um, now on the West Coast, a lot of natives actually hunted whales and fished in the oceans using canoes. So that's one way they use um, their environment to their advantage. Uh, in the deserts, uh, there's these people called the Anasazi, some other natives. Um, they lived in the modern day Four Corners region, which is where four different states meet, like in Four Corners. Um, they actually built cliff dwellings under, they, so they built like their villages and houses and stuff underneath cliffs to protect them from sandstorms, which was really cool. So that's another way that natives used, um, natives worked around and through the environment. Um, so by 900 CE, the Anasazi were actually living in pueblos or villages or large apartments made of stone or clay under these cliffs, which is really cool. And here's a picture of those. On the East Coast, we have what is called Mississippian culture. Uh, so these are natives like the Cherokee or the Iroquois, you may have heard of, um, all living on the East Coast. Uh, they actually built earthen burial mounds. This is one that is in Lumberton. So there's, there's, these things are everywhere. Um, these mounds are going to continue to be built for some 500 years. Uh, and eventually their purpose is going to expand to things like religious ceremonies. Um, they did live in villages based around agriculture. And generally they were ruled by priest kings. They regulated, regulated farming activities. So this is a theocracy. Um, but it's also dynastic in nature. Over here on the right, we can see kind of what like a Mississippian culture. So like an Eastern Native American village would look like. We've got these tall, sharp spears going all the way around the village, kind of like build a wall. And then you've got your houses in the middle and then a fire in between in the middle of all that. Now, eventually, they're going to start building these villages on top of these mounds because they realize, wow, that's a really good way to uh, defend yourself. But that doesn't come to a little bit later. So natives actually across North America traded um, largely through and over the Mississippi River. So Mississippi, Mississippi River goes all the way through the United States, kind of cuts it into a third and then two thirds. Um, natives have a lot in common in North America. They share very similar religious beliefs. Um, generally speaking, they believe in nature spirits. So like tree, the trees have a god, the wind has a god, that kind of thing. Um, natives often used or wore totems. This is a totem. This is one that they would put outside of their teepee or their home to indicate who lives there. So like each of these animals or like carvings represents something important in your life. So you could look at somebody's totem, you could see all of the image stacked up on each other and you would know who would live there. It's kind of like their signature. They don't have writing, so this is kind of important. Um, so some natives are gonna have these like outside their homes. A lot of natives are gonna wear them around their neck, but generally speaking, natives are something that they all had in common. So, we do have civilization in North America, though it is not nearly as advanced as what we saw in South America and Central America with the Aztec, Maya, and Inca. Um, and that's quickly going to change when the Europeans show up. So the Spanish, if you look over here on the map, the yellow is Spain. So we can see that the, that the Spanish conquered pretty much all of Central America, about half of South America, and then actually up into the United States, taking over most, most of California, Texas, and a little bit more than that. Um, as well as the Caribbean, but the Spanish mostly stay out of North America, North America proper over here, especially the East Coast. Um, the first to actually colonize North America were the Dutch. So the Dutch is this brown color right here. So they had some colonies up here and some up here. Um, the English and the French are going to quickly follow them and kick the Dutch out of North America. The English and the French actually fight over their colonies in North America in what was called the French and Indian War which was part of the larger Seven Years' War, which is one of your key vocabulary. The Seven Years' War was kind of like the First World War. Pretty much all of the super, all of the European powers were either on one side or the other, and they were fighting each other along with their colonies 
over lots of different things. Um, but one of the things that they were fighting over were these colonies and how these colonies being so close to each other was making other European countries angry. Um, natives, both in, in North America, largely got along with the French and the Dutch because the French and the Dutch were really just trying to make it rich. Um, so one of the coolest things you could ever own or wear in this time period is beaver pelts. So women loved to wear beaver pelts, beaver pelt jackets, beaver pelt scarves, beaver pelt hats. It was a big thing. And it was such a big thing that the European beaver actually went extinct. They killed them all because they wanted their pelts. Well, there's lots of beavers left in North America. So the French and the Dutch, they go to North America looking for things like gold or whatever, and they don't really find it. But they do find lots and lots of beavers. Um, so they start hunting the beavers, getting the pelts, and then taking them back to Europe and selling them. So who knows where the beavers are? The natives do because they've been living here forever. Who hunts beaver really well? The natives do because they've been living, been living here forever. So the French and the Dutch generally just kind of like put settlements down and then the natives come to the settlements and then they trade like guns and metal and money and food and stuff to the natives for the beaver pelts and then they take the beaver pelts back. So the French and the Dutch really get along pretty well with the natives because they're everybody's winning. They're not really taking the natives' land. Um, the English are very different. They're coming to stay. Um, so England starts building very, very permanent colonies very, very large colonies. They start building plantations. Um, and this leads to constant war with the natives. A uh, cool thing about this map, do notice Brazil is green. Um, Brazil was colonized by the Portuguese, not the Spanish, which again is why Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish. Now we talk about something called mercantilism. This is a somewhat complicated topic. Um, but so basically here's the way it works. A mother country, say England, establishes colonies, say North Carolina, because North Carolina was an English colony. So we've got our mother country, England. They establish colonies like North Carolina. Now, why does a mother country establish colonies? Two reasons. Number one, they want North Carolina's resources. North Carolina's got lots of wood. It's got lots of tar, which is really important in shipbuilding. So England wants the wood and the tar from North Carolina. So North Carolina is going to sell wood and tar to England very, very cheaply. Because, because North Carolina is a colony of England, North Carolina can only sell stuff to England. They can't sell stuff to Spain or France. So they're going to sell all of their wood and all of their tar to England really cheaply because it's the only people they can sell to. England is going to sell North Carolina manufactured goods. So it's going to take that wood and that tar and make boats and sell those boats to North Carolina. It's also going to sell clothing and guns, and alcohol, and anything that's hard to make, England is going to make and sell to the colony, North Carolina, and North Carolina is going to sell some of its resources back to England for a very cheap price. So who benefits the most from this relationship? It is England. Who gets hurt the most in this relationship? Slaves. So the key to the raw materials is cheap labor. These colonies have slaves working in them, and it's those slaves that are actually producing much of the raw materials and resources like cotton, like tobacco, like the wood, all of that stuff. So who wins? England. Who loses the most? The slaves. But the colonies are also not getting as much as they could if they were independent, which will eventually bring us to the American Revolutionary War. If we were to look at, look at mercantilism as it actually happened, that would be triangular trade. So Europe... They've got lots of machines and stuff. They're like somewhat industrialized. They're going to sell manufactured goods to Africa and to the Americas, the old world and the new world. So Europe is going, the Europeans are going to come by ship to Africa. They're going to sell the African kings firearms, clothing, alcohol, and in exchange, you're going to get slaves. Now, Europeans don't go into Africa and capture slaves because Africa has got this thing called malaria. It's got this thing called the Setsi fly. It's got all kinds of things that kill Europeans they don't have protection against. So largely African kings are selling slaves to Europeans. These slaves aren't their own people. They're people that they were, have been captured in war, like how slavery has worked throughout this class. Um, so Europeans are going to buy slaves from African kings in exchange for manufactured goods. They're going to take those slaves to the Americas where they sell those slaves for the raw materials whether that's wood or cotton, sugar, molasses, indigo, furs, lumber, rice, silk, all of that stuff, which is going to go back to Europe 
and it's going to do it again. Manufactured goods to Africa, slaves to the New World, raw materials to Europe, and so on and so forth. Now, it didn't always go in a triangle. Sometimes Europe would take manufactured goods directly to the Americas. But generally speaking, that is triangular trade. It's mercantilism as it actually worked. Okay? Take a few minutes, answer your three daily objectives.